Hello, everybody. How are you doing? Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, welcome to the Bad West Facebook Live event in conversation with Charles Metcalf and Trey Daniel. Uh, hopefully, Trey will be joining us soon. And uh, they are the featured activists, as I call them in the documentary film, Racist Trees. Uh, the event will be moderated by uh, Charles Reese, who is an actor, producer, and architect for public engagement. My name is uh, Joyce Guy. I'm one of the uh, co-chairs of the Black Association of Documentary Filmmakers West, uh, Bad West. And Bad West is a fiscally sponsored uh, membership organization um, based in Los Angeles, whose mission uh, is to champion and further uh, advance the art of Black documentary filmmakers across the diaspora. Uh, on Saturday, May 13th, uh, from 12 p.m. to 5 p.m., our organization, Bad West, uh, will present our signature, or, uh, signature event, the Day of the Day of, uh, what is it called? The Day of Black, Day of Black Dogs. Day of Black Dogs on uh, May 13th at AFI. And uh, we'll be featuring uh, four films. And one of the featured films is uh, Racist Trees. Uh, so before we start the event, let me, uh, we're gonna show a trailer uh, of the film so you can kind of get a sense of uh, what our conversation will be about. Uh, let's show, um, let's show the trailer. Palm Springs is the one resort in America which has everything. When most people think of Palm Springs, they're thinking of the restaurants and the hotels and the pool sites. And I'm thinking, wow, this looks really nice to me. And then you pass this wall of trees. You're in an entirely different world. As a kid growing up, they were just trees. But as we got older, we started to understand they were planted to hide this community because of the people who lived here. At the time, African-Americans were not allowed to live inside Palm Springs proper. A wealthy African-American man bought this tract of land and developed it as a place for black families. At the same time, a golf course was being developed. And it's unclear exactly why or when, but a row of trees went in. It actually takes about 10 feet to 15 feet of my yard. I feel like I'm not a part of Palm Springs with those trees up. Why is my property value not going up? Real estate has exploded in Palm Springs. If this had been a Caucasian community from the begin with, there would be no issue here. Nobody at City Hall is convinced at all that this is a racist issue or ever was a racist issue. City Council doesn't include anyone that looks like me. We're so progressive, we're so liberal, that accusing Palm Springs of being racist now is almost ridiculous to me because we just don't see it. Do they have any other negative impact? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Just quickly, how many want them out? Raise your hand. About a root. Who wants them to stay for any reason? There's a reason that they're there. The first article I published about the trees got a lot of reaction. Liberals have run out of racist statues to take down. What racist sentiments have they expressed to you? It is their intent. Now, now, whoa, on. You can be a progressive town and still hold on to racist tradition. They've been staring at a wall. What's the difference between that wall and the Berlin Wall? They can prove that by one simple act, remove the trees. The Palm Springs City Council voting tonight. Okay, we have a motion to approve. Motion is on the floor. Palm Springs offers accommodations to suit every purse and every personality. Okay, so that was the trailer. I'm not quite sure what happened to Charles. Uh, I guess, he, uh, you know, we're in the land of technology and uh a Wi-Fi, and I just got a word that he's uh, signing back in. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, while we wait for Charles to come back, and there he is, there he is. Hello, Charles. Hey there. Okay, perfect timing. And well, perfect, you know. perfect timing. So we just showed the trailer. So, um, so I'm going to let uh, our moderator, Charles Reese, uh, uh, take it away. Well, thank you so much, Joyce Guy. Charles, thank you for being here. Just for content's sake, Charles is going to... Thanks. Charles is going to be Charles 1 when we're talking, so we know we're talking to, and I'm going to be Charles 2. I'm going to dive right in, Charles, because I want you to tell us 
just a little back history about your, your family and uh, as a black family being in Palm Springs. Can you repeat that question? You got choppy and, uh, you know, some of your questions. Sure, sure. It got choppy. Okay, I'll, I'll slow down. And, and, and if, if, any, if for any reason I get cut off, I'm going to come back. So let me just get this first question out and okay. I'll try to do some adjustments while you're going. On. So the question is, just give me, tell me a little brief back history of your family as a black family living in Palm Springs. <clears throat> so I think it'll be good for people who want to come to the film. Okay, yeah, it's uh, a great question. Uh, my, my family originally came from Mississippi. They, uh, back in the late 40s, 50s, and, you know, they made a pit stop in New Mexico, then they came on out to uh, Palm Springs area, where they settled on Section 14, and I know you've probably been hearing about um, things about Section 14, how yes. they, one day, they, you know, which Indian Reservation, which is now downtown Palm Springs, around where the Spa Casino is, uh, you know, Tocquits and Indian and Palm Canyon, that area. And so one day they went to work, they came home and found their homes bulldozed to the ground, pushed up mm. in a pile and set on fire. So they had to scramble to find places to live because they came home one day and, you know, like I said, came back and, they, and their, their dwellings were were leveled. So that pushed people out toward what they call the North Palm Springs area or gateway community. Mm -hmm. uh, and then others went up to like Banning, California and uh, the, the foresight of Mr. Crosley, you know, the visionary, he bought 20 acres that was outside of the city of Palm Springs. Now, Cro Crosley time, was a, excuse me, Crosley was a black man, correct? Yes, he was. Yeah. Yes, he was. And he bought 20 acres, which is now the Crosley Tracks. But at the time he bought it, it was outside of the city limits because blacks, they would not, uh, would not allow blacks to uh, live within the city limits. So he bought that for the domestic workers to have a place to live so that they didn't have to travel from long distances because they work in Palm Springs. They mm. just couldn't live in Palm Springs. Now, the Crosley Tracks area where I grew up at was kind of like a village. It was two streets. It's a track area. This is why we call it a, call it the Crosley Tracks. Uh, and there were other black families from the South, from Texas and Louisiana, uh, who all ended up buying homes out there. And all the elders, mm -hmm. you know, they had children and all that. And we, we were like one big happy family, although some was from Louisiana, some was from Texas, others from Mississippi, and so on. And then, you know, we grew up out there uh, just in a, in a community. Uh, at the time I was growing up, you can leave your front doors open. And every adult was watching everybody mm. else's kids. And I come from that era where, uh, you know, Mr. Dorsey or Mr. Brignac or Mr. Aaron, although I'm not their child, if they saw me doing something wrong, they could uh -huh. give me a little a little tanning and send me home where it happened to a little nerd, huh? <laughs> Yeah. So okay. but I, I and I wouldn't give it up I wouldn't change it for the reason. I mean, because being out there in that community at that time, you know, really instilled that's who that's a big part of why I am who I am today. Uh we used to go from house to house having prayer service and Bible study stuff like that and uh we helped each other the families helped each other and you know as kids you know we mm -hmm. we were just kids uh running up and down the street i go so far back charles to and, and joyce to where <laughs> there were no sidewalks or no street lights and, and what road, year was that mm -hmm. i mean i mean not to give your age so what uh uh were you born in Palm Springs or did your family yeah. move to Palm Springs? No, no, no. My, I, I was born and raised in Palm Springs. In fact, my, oh, oldest okay. two, my oldest two brothers were born when my parents used to live in Section 14 down on the Indian Reservation. So 
and then me and my sister, because there's four of us, three boys and one girl, me and my sister were born later after they had moved out to the Crosby tracks. Okay, and, great. Um, I see the history. That was... Well, I'm not ashamed of Joyce. I'm not ashamed of my age, you know. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank you, age. For, you know, thank just you the for, number for us in this group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, I was born in '65, December. So, okay. You know, I'm I'm 57 today, so that was back in the early '60s and mid '60s, uh, where all this was taking place, and our road wasn't a smooth road. It's like they dumped asphalt, bumped rocky asphalt for our roads. Uh, but mm. thanks to uh, Mr. Carlton Aaron Sr., uh, who used to work for the post office, he really got a lot of the changes going. Uh, he, he got our mm-hmm. roads fixed. He got, he got us sidewalks. He got us street lights, And then he started getting trying to get those trees removed but the city fought back on that. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. They kept placing the blame, you know, kicking the can and stuff like that. Uh, and then it kind of like just went away for years until Trey hit the scene and, you know, Trey started going down to City Hall like Mr. Aaron was. But <clears throat> I guess they seen Trey as one of their own um, because they actually listened to him because things started going and I'm you know, I'm, I'm sorry that he was unable to uh, be a part of this. this, this yeah. Because uh, I don't, I don't want to speak for him. Uh, but you know, I get a, I get a call one day, or I got wind of Trey and what he was trying to do, and I jumped on board wholeheartedly. <laughs> because you know, those trees. I mean, those trees were like 60, 70 feet high, and maybe about 20 feet wide. Uh, real nasty, but as kids, they were just trees. You know, we played in them. We went through them. We played on the golf course, stuff like that. Uh, we went out there. We played football, bas- uh, baseball, stuff like that. But then we would crawl right back through the trees. That in the cliff, you see that opening tray went through was one of our main ways that we accessed the golf course. But as we got older, as we started getting older, you know, because kids don't know nothing, right? <laughs> yeah, true. Sure. Like, but as you start getting older and then you start hearing conversations, you start reading, uh, you know, news articles and stuff like that, then you start to understand that these trees, and then, you know, if you look in the whole area, there's no other tamarisk trees around there except for in that neighborhood. And then that's where you start understanding that, you know, these were uh, deliberately planted here. And then when you start digging to find out, oh, okay, they were growing in the golf course. And, you know, they they knew that African-Americans lived on one side so to shield us so that the golfers would not see us. And mm-hmm. all of that, that's why those trees were, were planted there. And that, that brings us to that title called Racist Trees, which is the yes. name, of course, of the documentary. Well, first of all, I thank you for that history because it is always amazing to have history to give people who want to come see the film a little back history of it. Uh, as it relates to Trey, for people who are listening, Trey will be in the film, so you'll hear his actual voice when you come yeah. to see the film on May the 13th. So yeah. I appreciate that. It, this also sounds like to me a little, uh, I'm gonna say a little, it has the toss or race riots kind of sort of, I won't say feeling. I, I have to watch my little words because when, you, when you're dealing with systemic racism and things that have happened to you, and you, mm-hmm. it's, it's been in your family for a long time. And then you're the person now that gets to carry this to the next generation and share it with your actual children. What yeah. do you want to, people who are going to come see this on May 13th, what do you want them to get out of this film? What would you tell young children, other people, other family members who, you know, who migrated from the South uh, to the West? For you know, for whatever reason, but today in this society now, what would you tell? Uh, what you want people to get from this film once they see it? What's the message? Well, the message is that you know we need to take a because sometimes we we may be inherently racist, but not realize that we are by our actions. Mm. These were actions that took place uh, on purpose because 
of the African American people who lived in the community versus the white golfers and then even the condominiums that sit on the other side of the golf course who don't have any trees at all. It's just open to the golf course. Always have been. Uh, so we need to be aware of our actions. Uh, we may not go around with a flag saying I'm racist, but our actions may say that we may have some racist tendencies or we may have some biases that we don't see for ourselves. Uh, because like, uh, I believe was, his name was Kurt. He was like, I don't see these trees being racist and being planted for racist reasons. But they were. They were because at that time, blacks were not golfing on the Palm Springs Municipal Golf Course, which mm-hmm. was the name of it back then. There were no black golfers. They were all white. There were no African-American people living in the condominiums adjacent to the other side of the golf course. They were all white. And so Mm -hmm. the only other color of people were African-Americans who were on the other side. And so those trees were put in so that we could not see them, you know? So it's a beautiful film. Um, and, and, and I do encourage everyone to, as, much, as anybody can, go see it. Because in order to know where you're going or to change things, you've got to know what happened in the past. And you got to know why they happened in the past in order to make change for the future. Um, <clears throat> we, we are truly one people. Uh, we, and I don't want to start preaching none, but... We, we, there's one God and there's one people. You, uh, you can. Again, because <laughs> I am a, I am a minister. So <laughs> you can preach. Um, that, listen, this is your show. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, we, we, we are certainly one people. We, we are made up of different skin tones and different cultural backgrounds. But that's what makes us mm-hmm. beautiful. We're not different. From one another, we we want to provide for our families. We want to we want to have children. We want to extend our families. We want to experience happiness with our families. We want to raise our children and see them go off and do well in life. This is why we teach them. This is why we train them. This is why we encourage them to get educated. This is why we encourage them to take on a career, a profession, and to one day, you know, like you say, for the future, because that's the next generation. You know, kind of like the uh, Will Smith movie, In Pursuit of Happiness. Everybody wants to be happy. Everybody wants to be in that pursuit of happiness or whatever makes them happy. Um, But we need to look at history to see, engage ourselves. I mean, use the film to, to, to... gauge ourselves for us to stand in the mirror and, and look and see who am I as a person? How do I treat other people? How do I look at other people? Are, are they different because, you know, I, you know, we eat different foods. We come from different areas or cultures of, I mean, uh, uh, different geographical locations. But the thing is, we're not different. We all bleed red blood. We all need oxygen to, to live. We all need substance. We all need food, you know, to survive. So we're more alike than we are different. If, if the first thing people see about another person is the color of their skin, you probably are racist. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. You know, I, as a filmmaker, I have a question. So how did you get involved in the film? How did the filmmakers find you? Can you talk uh, it about was Sarah that? Newman? Yeah, right. I, I kind of forget how it happened. Uh, I think it was because uh, it was an article uh, in the Desert Sun. Uh, I believe her name was Corinne. Corinne, Corinne, or or I hate to mess it up. Uh, it started. That's how it all started, from an article that was written uh, in the Desert Sun newspaper. Uh, then somehow or another, and again, I don't want to speak for the people, but Sarah got a hold of it. And somehow somebody put her in touch with me. And I, at the time, I was living in Minnesota. And so uh, when, when she got in touch with me and told me that she wanted to do a documentary, 
on these trees and my community in which I was born and raised in all of my life. I I was, hey, look, let's do it. You know, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. just, just just tell me. And so I would I would fly back and forth from uh, Minnesota home to Palm Springs. Wow. Wow. Whenever they were uh, filming or needed me here, I would fly back and forth and to be a part of it. And then when, kind of like right now, it, when there were things that well, I really didn't need to fly out here, we would do something like this. We, I would, you know, over the phone, I would answer questions or whatever. Uh, and then it just, it just took off. Uh, and here, here we are today. Uh, I was real excited when I, I got the text message from from Sarah saying that Black Docs or or you, you know your company or group had seen it or heard about it and wanted to premiere it in L.A. And I was like, Oh yeah, you know that's great to hear. Yeah. Uh, and um, and, I, and of course I'll be a part of it. I, I'm I'm in it for the long haul and anything I could do to promote it. Again, because uh, Charles number two was asking, what do I want people to get out of this? This is a documentary. It's it's true, but go see the documentary, see the film, and then stand in the mirror and see where you stand. And I'm not pointing to anybody. You would plural in this sense. Stand in the mirror and, and, and ask yourself, who am I as a person when it comes to other people who do not look like me? Right. You know, wh where, where do I stand? I mean, how do I think of, uh, of mm -hmm. somebody who's African-American or somebody who's, because there were Hispanics that was down on Section 14 as well. It wasn't just African-Americans. It was African-Americans. It was Hispanics. And so we, we all got, our families all got moved out. And so some of, uh, like the Medianos, they still live out on the Crosley track. Some of the family's still out there. So just look at who yourself is. If you really want the world to be a better place, like Michael Jackson said, we got to look at the man in the mirror. We, we have to start with us, start with us as an individual. And this film, this, this documentary will help you because although trees, these, these tamarisk trees are not going up all over the world, it could be other types of trees, so to speak, that are separating people because they're not similar or like they are, if I'm making any sense. You're making a lot, a lot of sense. Um, I had, um, anyway, try, I, I, I lost my train of thought. I had a question, I'll, it'll come back to me, uh, but go ahead. Uh, oh, okay, so Charles uh, uh, just went away. So, Are you part of the suit because it's in the it's been in the newspapers? As a matter of fact, we uh, you know sent a link out. Um, so, are you part of that suit that's happening? Uh, that uh, uh, some of the uh, African Americans and some of the Latino community are uh, have at the present time? Are you part of that? Uh, me, um, how can I say this? Uh, I want to say yes and then no, and, okay. and allow me to explain. My parents, my mom, my father, and my two older brothers, they actually lived, uh, and uh, along with a lot of my other family members, but I'm just speaking about my individual family at this point, but they actually lived on the reservation. Wow. And so my parents are participants. My mom, my father, and my two older brothers. Uh, when my sister and I came along, we were out on the Crosley tracks. But because I'm a descendant of my, you know, I'm, I'm my mom's and my dad's offspring is where I would say yes again. So uh, I want to say yes and, and, and no, but more yes, because like I said, my parents were, were there. They were affected. My two older brothers, they were there. They were affected. And then I have aunts, uncles, grandparents who are some who are now deceased, but their offspring uh, have, you know, listed themselves. So, but, so for the better part, I'm going to just say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
I hear you. Listen, I made it back in. Technical difficulties, but we're going to yeah. keep on moving through. Listen, yeah, this section 14, pushing. yeah, you got to keep pushing through. Uh, this section 14 yeah. seems to be a very, um, and, and when you come see the film, I don't want to give it away. It does say something very specific about what's going on with section, section 14. Um, but I, uh, it seems like there's a, another piece of history just about section 14 by itself with you and your family that might be of some interest to continue to keep talking about. Um, how does, how does your, um, how do you share, uh, this would be my question before we close up. How do you continue to um, enlighten and inspire your children that's coming behind you to take on what might need to be carried on after you're coming to home, the next generation? Yeah, I know it's a big you know, one, but family. breathe through it. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, that's no, that's a great question. That's a great question, um, and and I'm glad that you you asked it. Uh, for me, what I do is, is, is again, I go back to history, and I and I tell my my, my children, this mm -hmm. would happen to your family. This is what this is what happened to your grandparents and, and to your your uncles and your, you know your great grandmothers, your great aunts and your great uncles. You you cannot. You know, because like my my dad, you know, he's he's going to be I think 88 this year. My mom is going to be 80. So, and, and I don't want to put them in the grave or anything, but mm -hmm. you know, they you know they're close. Uh, but any one of us can go at any time. But I let them know that they're going to have to continue on the fight. It's already started, you know, and uh, we got to start it. And and like you, I don't want to speak too much on it because it is in litigation. And so I don't want to say anything that, okay. that you know, uh, I may not have a clear understanding or I don't want to say anything that's going to. But they, I let them know that they were living in an area, which is downtown Palm Springs. They came home one day and without notice. I mean, it's just like you go to work and then you come home and where your house is gone. gone. And not only is it gone, you see these big old piles that's on fire. They brought in the, the fire department to set it on fire. It's not, it wasn't enough for them to just bulldoze down the, the properties, but they set the piles on fire too. <laughs> so, I mean, who does that? They just came in, no warning, no nothing. They didn't give the people an opportunity to relocate. They just, I mean, everything they own was in there. They just bulldozed, bulldozed it down. So I let my children know the history and the events. I let them know where we are now with the lawsuits fighting to, 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 to be made whole. You know, because that, again, set us back even further than, you know, like slavery just set us back three, four hundred years. That event, that act set us back again. And so that's what I let them know. And to, 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 to stay uh, privy to the information and what's happening and where things are. So if anything should happen to any one of us, you're going to have to step in and take take the spot. You're going to have to step in mm -hmm. our place and continue on. You know, so that, that's, that's how I try to encourage them uh, to, to, you know, pick up the fight. Good. Not even, not even. Listen. I, I... I'm sorry. Just. I try to tell them get in now, get involved now. That way you will okay. kind of like yeah. being on a team. Yep. So you know what's happening. And so they happen, they will be. You can get put right in the game. Right. So oh, yeah. ahead, you have them well prepared. Yeah, you have them well prepared. Right. So that that's yes, that that's a blessing all by itself. Because a lot of times we know that when it comes to the next generation, we go. Who passes the torch on how you get it? Like James Baldwin said, know whence you came. If you know whence you came, there are no limits to where you can actually go. So I appreciate you and your family for passing that on to your uh, to the next generation and also allowing them to participate now while you're still with us. I think that's so right. important. Um, mm -hmm. Those are all the questions that I have. I want to encourage people. Well, first of all, I want to just really thank you. I know I was going in and out, but I got to hear most of everything. And I always came back in right on time. So <laughs> I, 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 I think that's so that's so I'm like, that's so wonderful. But um I, I, I want to send kudos to you and your family. 
um, keep you all uplifted, um, strong, stay diligent, stay resilient, um, keep your family safe, um, love on each other, hug on each other as much as you can. Joyce, I'm going to throw it back to you because um, May the 13th, everybody that's out there that's listening now can go see what Charles One has been talking about all evening. Um, and we thank you again, Charles. Joyce, I'm going to turn it back to you. Okay. Thank you again for, thank you, uh, Charles One, Charles Metcalf, uh, as I call him. He's our, the, he's one of the featured activists. And from this conversation, he's definitely an activist, you know, in the film. And again, thank you to uh, Charles Reese. Um, for moderating uh, this afternoon. And for those of you who want more information on how to get tickets for our Day of Black Docs event on May 13th from 12 to 5 um, at the American Film Institute AFI, uh, you can go to our website, which is www.dayofblackdocs.org or on our Facebook page, the Bad West uh, page. And, uh, and again, thank you for this incredible conversation. And uh, again, Charles Metcalf, many blessings to you and your family and uh, Charles Reese. And uh, thank you everybody. And uh, hope to see you on Saturday. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye Charles one. <laughs> anything from me, just let me know. You're Bye gonna, Joyce. You're gonna so I'll be there. Okay, okay I will you. do that my friend. Okay, be thanks wise. a lot. All right. Bye, Joe. Bye. Bye. Charles Reese. Okay, let me see. Uh, oh, okay. Let me go back uh, in broadcast. In broadcast. Okay, let me 